well as beer and pizza, and plenty of time for networking afterwards. I'd like to start this evening with a bit of a background of, on who we are and our events, the format for the evening, and then introduce our wonderful lineup of speakers. This is us, this is our team who organizes this event. Uh, you can see me here and my colleague who's also here tonight, Shurat. And uh, we basically have, an, we have two web portals that you can see here. Data Economy and FinTech Journal, and I'll talk to you a bit more about Data Economy. So the basic premise behind all of Data Economy's work, both online and offline, is in both events and content, is to unifying uh, Europe's data science community. When most pe people think of big data, their mind immediately shifts in Silicon Valley, but we think there's something exciting, innovation happening here across the continent. And we want to be the people who bring together the innovators and to bring the potential of data science to a wider audience. We now have events across 14 different cities. So one of the most organic ways to achieve this is through our offline events and detach the people from the screen and bring them here to meet in person, like here in Berlin. We organized our first event actually in Berlin in August last year, and this is the fifth one so far. We, bring, we brought together 350 local supporters and data enthusiasts, and we hope we're going to continue bringing more. So we bring with us nights of inspiring talks and a laid-back, collaborative atmosphere. Our events, as I told you, they take place in 14 different cities across the continent and the United Community of over 9,000 members. We aim for our talks to be high-level enough that even big data beginners can find them useful but with enough of tech focus that our developers and data scientists can still be engaged. With that in mind, we have four great speakers for you this evening, followed by time for questions, then open networking plus food. Hello everybody. My Deutsch is nicht sehr gut, so I'll speak in English. My name is Peter Milan, I'm the Director of Application Engineering for Merispike, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about the principles of HiLoad and give you a little bit of philosophy and anecdote. You can find me at any of these addresses here. Um, you will notice Hubschrauber Pilot. That's what I do in my spare time for fun. I guess if I had a crack habit, it would have been cheaper. <laughs> Let me talk about these two people. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's what Albert Einstein said. This guy, Charles Duell, he said that everything that can be invented has been invented. He said that in 1899, he was in the US Patents Office. Obviously he wasn't right. I bring these two things up because if you're going to do something new and different, you need to take a different approach than has been done in the past. I've got a short video for you to watch. So that's 10 seconds of video. I took it at Shinagawa Railway Station in Tokyo last December during the rush hour. Everybody who passes through these gates uses a Suica card like this and they tap it on the gate to enter the railway station, to transfer from one railway line to another, and to be charged at the end of it. So there is a large number of events that occur in a short period of time. The entry and the exits are used for statistics, and the card has currency associated with it, a value associated with it, and that needs to be checked to see if it's valid for the trip, whether they need to top it up. That's an example of high low. In that 10 seconds, you saw 200, 250 people. There are nine gates in Shinagawa, and there are about 50 different railway stations in Tokyo within itself. So high low. So what are some real examples of high low? Any time now, we'll get a change, change in our slide. Okay, 
got two at once. The first example I have for you is the advertising technology, ad tech. Some of you in the room may be involved in ad tech. Berlin is a place where things happen in Europe. So ad tech, whenever you click on a website that you're going to, when you do that click, a little, a little auction occurs, real-time bidding occurs where somebody wants to place an ad in front of you and they have 100 milliseconds to respond back to the ad exchange. They discover who you are by your cookie or your device ID, guess what gender you are, what your age is, what you're interested in, and try and present an ad to you that you're interested in. Um, being here in, in Europe, all of you use the internet every day. A company called Adform in Lithuania does most of the real-time bidding, and all of you have touched Adform and the Aerospike database today. So this is the kind of load, about 3 million a second in North America. So today, uh, programmatic advertising is spreading throughout the world. And so I would, I would guess that in all the world, it's probably about 9 million a second. That's high load. Travel portals. We all jump on the internet now to book our flights from Berlin to Stuttgart. We do that through all sorts of travel portals. The portal itself goes out to the airline to get a price quote. Rather than paying that expense each time, they cash that data. So that if you and I book the same destination at about the same time, they don't have to go and get it again. This is about 1 million transactions per second and is increasing rapidly. Financial services is an example of one of our customers who do day trading, trading on stock markets like the DAX. The uh, positions are loaded at the beginning of the day. A million transactions a second buys and sells occur on the database. It's a database of records, so the transactions are recorded and at the end of the day, they're reconciled, reconciled back into a legacy database. So these examples of high load. Think about your job or your life, and you understand that we all generate lots of events that are being captured and analysed to make our lives more comfortable or more interesting or sell something to us. So that's some examples of high load. Let me give you some de definitions. This is kind of computer science, your first year at university. Let's start with the word throughput. Throughput is the rate at which things are done in any system, but in the computer system we always measure them. So it's really the work done over the time taken, similar to power. So the power of a system that you build or you use is proportional to its throughput. Now you know that uh, time is money and that knowledge is power and if you substitute that into that formula and rearrange it, you'll know that the more knowledge you have, the less money you'll make. <laughs> it's sort of latency. Everybody talks about latencies, device latencies, network latencies. Latency is the time something takes when it enters the system, whatever you are calling the system the device, the network, the sum of the two. So that's latency. A bottleneck. Those of you who studied thermodynamics in university will know that this is kind of a choke valve. And you have a high pressure and high temperature on this side and it pops out this side, everything cools down. Bottlenecks are caused by things depending upon a common shared resource. Some of these are built into the hardware of your computer systems and networks. Others, you code by mistake. You talk about concurrency. Here's an example. We have two parallel streams of work occurring, and they need to use a shared resource, one at a time. Locks are acquired and released. So concurrency is when more than one set of tasks are running at the same time, but they somehow share a resource. They somehow use something common to all of them. You know what it's like when you go to the post office? Postal workers are the same all over the world. You have the same kind of a, a process where they become the shared resource when you get to the counter. Parallelism is different. 
parallelisms where you don't have any shared resource, and in our case here, we have some kind of problem that's going through a process, and we happen to have enough processors, enough cores, enough people, to do all of the work. So let me show you the comparison. That's concurrency. This is parallelism. One, there is shared resources, things running at approximately the same time, and parallelism is things actually running at the same time. To do any kind of concurrency or to do any kind of parallelism, you need to petition your workload. So you need to chop your work up into independent things, independent tasks, that can be done at the same time. These bees do their own work. They make their own uh, wax and they make their own honey. They all contribute to the health of the hive, but they do their own work, independent of each other. So I work for Aerospike, and so I'm going to tell you how Aerospike achieves high load using our technology. It's not a secret. They're not going to lock me away when I get back to the office. Aerospike's a, a distributed database, a clustered database, no simple database. So the first secret we have is we petition the work using the right MD160 hashing algorithm or some bits out of it. So when you present a record to be written or read in Aerospike, we use the key that you've given us to determine which node it's put on, which data partition it belongs in, which node it's put on. That's the first piece of secret. So there's a single hop between, say, a client and a server. There's no uh, double hop, there's no master or slave or coordinator and participant. The cluster itself has a bunch of, a group of, a collection of nodes that are identical. There isn't a single point of failure. Each node is a peer with the other one. It's nothing shared. We have locally attached storage, so you don't have the cost of going out to a SAN or a NAS over the network. Built in immediate consistency, automatic load balancing, automatic failover and we can add nodes under load and automatically rebalance the cluster. That's built into Aerospike. That makes uh, it easy to program for and to um, administer. So we distribute the data in an Aerospike cluster evenly. We do it with data petitions. Our workload is data. Your workload may be something different. So we chunk up the records that we're going to read or write, we put them in a logical data petition, and we evenly distribute those across the nodes in the cluster. And we do it for you, when you don't need to code it, it does it uh, automatically. Some of you may know this as sharding, if you're familiar with other NoSQL technologies. Sharding is a painful, complex thing to do that fails when you're on holiday with your wife or your, or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. We evenly distribute data across petitions, uh, petitions across nodes in the cluster, and data across flash devices within a node. So we scale horizontally and vertically. Let me talk about flash for a second. I'll give you a small lesson in what a flash device is, SSDs. We all have them in our pockets. They're those USB sticks that we carry data on. They're a collection of floating gate MOSFET transistors that retain this state when they have, don't have power on them. I can talk to you about details of this later on. They're arranged in a matrix similar to RAM, so they represent RAM more than they represent a rotational disk. They don't suffer from sick or rotational latencies, and they have parallel paths, so that you can do amazing things like read them 50,000 IOPS a second. So flash is a chunk of memory more like RAM than it is like disks. We exploit that. I'll show you how we exploit it. 
If you put an SSD into any system, it will be faster than rotational disks, magnetic disks. But what we do is we take out the file system designed for a rotational disk that's been around since I was at university, and we replace it with our own, because all we need to do is read and write blocks, read and write records. So what we get is RAM-like speeds out of flash devices. RAM has some incredibly fast latencies, are probably the maximum latency in a, a piece of RAM is about 0.3 milliseconds. So with SSDs we get on average between 0.6 to 0.9 milliseconds to do a read or a write on an SSD by using this technique. So why do we bother with flash? And that's a blank screen. Hmm. Okay. At this point, I'd make a joke about that's five polar bears populating in a snowstorm, but I wouldn't want you to think I'm crude. <laughs> that's a real shame. Let me tell you what the slide says. Um, we had a customer who needed to store 10 terabytes of data with times two replication, 500,000 transactions per second. And they calculated that with just an in-memory solution, they would require 186 servers to build a cluster that would accommodate their requirements. With our solution using Flash, they would need to use 14. Can you imagine going to your boss and saying, I need to buy 186 servers, or I can buy 14? What would he or she do? So Flash gives you a level of economy. The individual servers cost a little more, but they are uh, cheaper to run and you save money. It's about a 10 times saving. So 186 servers is going to cost you two and a half million dollars. Um, 14 is probably going to cost you 250,000. And another almost blank slide. Okay, so forget about what, I had a graphic over there that was the Yahoo Cloud Serving benchmark. But this is the benchmark that Aerospike uh, focuses on. You'll notice that Aerospike, compared to some of the, our um, uh, additional products that you find in the marketplace has a flat latency regardless of the transactions per second, regardless of the throughput. And that's what you want to strive for if you want to give predictable reliability to your database if you have high load. So let's talk about high load failures. I've given you some principles. I've told you how Aerospike does it and I can go into great detail later. The first high load failure that you will get is that you have the size of, or number of messages going through the network. The first one is you're sending elephants from one side of the network to the other. Do you need to send the whole elephant? Could you just send its foot and have somebody paint its toenail and come back? So if you don't have to send big messages, send only what you need. The other problem is when you're sending mice. Mice fit in the network beautifully, but you might be sending too many. Are you going across the network too many times? The next one is network design. You have a brilliant high-speed gigabit network in this portion of your network, and a super fantastic one down there that's going to cater for your cluster, but somewhere in your network is two guys with Morse keys tapping out a Bordeaux code between the two. You might think this is crazy, but in my career, I have found one in every performance-related problem. Somewhere in your network is this little piece of uh, cotton-covered wire that people are sending Morse on that only is used occasionally. The other thing is big locks. Big locks, if you hold a lock too long, if you have a critical section or a critical region, or um, I can't remember what it's called in Java. Uh, you, if you hold that for too long, you increase the latency of the whole system and decrease concurrency. The other one is you don't use the computing power that you have. Everybody's seen this, right? One guy doing all the work, the other six guys standing around going, yeah, it's a nice day today. It wasn't the soccer great last night. So that's the same in your computer. 
You're not using all of the cores that you have. You're not balancing the IRQs. One, per, one CPU, one core is doing more work than the others. So you've got to balance that out. You have to write your code to take advantage of that. Okay. The things... Let's try this again. See if that renders correctly. Just bear with me one second. Surprisingly, loops within loops, within loops, within loops, within loops, traced back through complex code, and you find things are being done many times when they only need to be done once. Unnecessary recursion. All of you remember that at university you were taught that most recursive problems can be solved with the appropriately designed loop. Single threaded or single task. This is where you write the code, you have this wonderful solution, but you have no parallelism in your code and no concurrency. And the last one is big locks. Now I'm not saying to replace frameworks or style. That's important. Idiomatic code is important. But I'm saying for high load, you have to think and do differently. All right, once again, I don't have a picture. Just give me a second. And there is no picture. So let me tell you about it. There should be a very big picture of uh, Heathrow Airport here. This is a highlighted failure. A few years ago, Heathrow opened a new terminal, terminal number five. And it was supposed to solve all of the problems. It's like a new programming language that's going to solve global warming and, and Middle East peace process and, and, and world hunger. Um, what happened was it was supposed to be calmer, smoother and simpler. But 24,000 people didn't get their bags. What they had done at every level was they had almost done their jobs. But they hadn't tested it under load. The good thing about it was this was used as a, bad was as a bad example and everybody learned from it. So new airline terminals that are open work successfully. I'd hate to have lost my bags. So let me give you some advice. When you've got hair the colour of mine and you've done everything, I'm one of the first programmers in the 1980s. I worked on the first commercial email system, so it's partly my fault. I apologise. Let me give you some advice so that you get some, some um, high load. First one, make, sure, make your locks small. If you're going to lock a resource, a portion of code, anything, make it as small as you can. Smaller locks are better than bigger ones. That doesn't mean you can't have big locks. It just means use them wisely. If you're familiar with the technology called Redis, they lock the whole database when they do a read or a write. The lock's probably a bit too big. Strive for parallelism at every step. You want to use multiple machines. That's what Aerospike does. Multiple cores within each machine. Multiple tasks or, or chunks of work. Multiple threads for the, that work to be done. Multiple IRQs where you can balance them across cores. And uh, a Could you really show me like how each and every CPU was utilized? And Chris said, well, I can do that, but I mean, that's a never-ending story, right? Jumping between the, the guy who wants to know more, or wants to, to get more information about it, and then on the other hand side, the business, who just wants to know what's what.